morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Uh, This spring, we've been walking through, we began our, our series in Psalms, just looking at assorted Psalms, asking the question, where is God in the messiness of life? Because life is filled with trials and temptation and circumstance that come our way. And God is there. God can be found. But also, the Psalms are one of these spots, primary spots in the Old Testament, where you find the prediction of the coming Messiah. That God is unveiling himself in dramatic form through the Psalms. And so we're, we're going to spend five weeks, last, beginning with last week, moving up till Easter, walking through Psalms and seeing the way that they predict the coming king. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 110, the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament. Okay, think about that for a second. What text does the New Testament quote the absolute most This psalm, Psalm 110. Last week, we were in Psalm 89. I'm going to spend the first half of this psalm moving from Psalm 89 to 110, showing you the context, the way that it's building together, and the flow of the book, that it ultimately unveils this presentation that Jesus is the coming king. Now, after we've looked at that flow, then we will begin, uh, with the time remaining, we'll look quickly at the psalm itself. Now, one other quick point. I know that this material that I'm unfolding last week and this week, that it can be difficult, um, that it's not so easily accessible. It requires us rolling up our sleeves to pay attention. It requires us taking notes, even writing down questions if it doesn't quite make sense, if I'm not crystal clear as I deliver it, okay? You may ask the question, why does the Bible, why does God write the Bible in a progressive revelation sort of way? You may not even know what that term means. What it means is is that God slowly unveils himself through history, okay? Why is it that the law had to come first and then ultimately lead towards the new covenant? Why is it that the law was a tutor ultimately unveiling the new covenant? Why is it that promises were given to the the Davidic king that ultimately, or, or that first find their fulfillment in Solomon, but ultimately lead towards the coming of the son of God? So let me pause to encourage you. This is how the sovereign God has chosen to reveal himself through his word. And he is worthy of our focus and our attention of thinking well and right about his word. And he will reward you. He has promised, if you seek him, you will find him. And there is something magnificent that we aim to see in God's word this morning. So come with me. Let's go on an adventure. Let's read this psalm, but let's roll up our sleeves and let's really think well and rightly about how we get from Psalm 89 to 110. So if you would, if you would please stand in honor of reading God's word. So I'm telling you up front, I want, when I read this, I want you to know and understand this is 100% about Jesus. Even though it was written a thousand years prior, this is 100% about Jesus. Also, there are two main sections of the psalm, two oracles, both promises about Jesus. The break at one through three and then four through seven. Okay, so listen as I read God's word. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, Your youth are to you as the dew. 
The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand, and he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge amongst the nations. He will fill them with corpses, and he will shatter the chief men over a broad country. And he will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning, as we come to to your word, as we pause to remember and to realize that you are the divine author, that you have revealed yourself to us, not only in creation, not only with a conscience or, or, or an impression of you inside of us, but through your revealed word. God, through your Holy Spirit, would you give us attention? Would you allow us to see? Would you be the lifter of our heads that rises up above the noise and circumstance of our day and is able to see with clarity, able to hear your voice and what you are doing from eternity past into eternity future, the sending of your son, the king, and where he sits now, and how that impacts our life. God, would you do incredible things, what only you can do this morning. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's start out with a little poll real quick, because I need to know, are you a a radio song kind of person, or are you the kind of person that loves the symphony? Now, when I say the symphony, I don't mean you just like getting dressed up so that you can look posh and kind of sophisticated. I mean like you get it, like you love the symphony. Okay, let's go ahead and do a quick, all right, how many of you are radio people? Raise your hand. You like that three to five minute song? Okay, and how many of you are symphony people? More than I expected, but right, I myself am a radio person, right? I only have so much of an attention span. Have you even noticed that songs these days are getting shorter and shorter on the radio, right? In the 70s, you remember Freebird with that eight-minute guitar solo at the end? I mean, you could get away with something like that, but no longer. Who has time for that long of a song? But the symphony right? It's an hour and a half. They have to have intermissions, okay? You you have five movements, sweeping movements on the ride home. Usually my party's like, wasn't that magnificent? And I sit there quietly hoping no one will ask my particular opinion. Jason, what was your favorite part? Probably the walk back to the car, yeah. You mean you didn't get it? You didn't, you didn't understand it? The whole thing was, was about the struggle, the fight, the complexity of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. All hour and a half and five movements, yes. All right, Jason, where are you going with this? The book of Psalms is a symphony. A symphony designed to be looked at both individually and with the long view, the high view, developed with patience that God has revealed his son is the coming king in symphonic fashion. So last week we looked at Psalm 89. And the context was so very important. If you weren't here last week, I I charge you, I beg you, go back and listen to last week's sermon because piecing these important texts together become so vital because what I want you to see this morning, it's magnificent. I'm gonna try and bridge that gap. The context that he wrote in Psalm 89 was an incredibly depressing spot. You see, Jerusalem had fallen The temple had been burned to the ground. And the Davidic kingdom, the line of of David kings, had been slain. And now the, the psalmist sat in exile 
reading his Bible, saying, but wait a second, you had promises that you had given to King David. Psalm 2, 2 Samuel 7, you had promised, God, you said that the Davidic line would last forever. That, that David's kingdom was a forever kingdom. God, you said that, that David's kings would be like a son to you. That, that you would treat them with special reverence. That you would bestow an anointing. That they are your anointed one. God, you said that even if we disobeyed, that you would discipline your son, but you would never remove. You would never forsake. You would never turn your back upon us, upon the promises that you have given to David. And then the psalmist writes, so in the psalm, Psalm 89, he lists out the promises. And then he comes to the climactic third movement and he says, but God, I'm looking around. And it doesn't look like your promises are true. It looks like you have forsaken us. There's not a Davidic king on the throne. Where is he? The temple has been, where is your presence, God? It doesn't look like any of this has played out according to your promises. And then the psalm ends with two lingering questions. How long, O oh Lord? And where is your love and your faithfulness that you swore. That's how the psalm ends. Psalm 89, it just comes to a conclusion, right? It just stops with those questions. And what you need to understand about the book of Psalms is that that is the last psalm in book three. And all of book three is a lament, Laments the fall of Jerusalem, the, the fall of the temple, and now where is the Davidic kingdom? And so that book of Psalm just ends just like that with these lingering questions. Where is the Davidic kingdom? So now, does, does book four open up and just give you an immediate answer? Don't worry. Jesus is coming. No. No. It's not how it works. Remember, I told you, it's a symphony. And in God's timing, we still have 500 years to go. 400 years of silence without a prophet. And so book four continues, and as it opens up, it continues to ask the question, how long, O Lord? By the way, book four is, is Psalm 90 to 106. How long, O oh Lord? And as it opens up, it, it, it starts and it highlights. You do know and understand that a thousand years is just like one day to God. It's just like one day to God. But man, he only gets 70 years, 80 if he has strength. And then he vanishes like the wind. But remember, God reigns. And God is worthy and God is faithful. You can look back and realize that God is faithful. This is the movement, the sweeping movement of book four. Through it, you get a glimpse, just a little glimpse that a new song is coming, that it's still in the future. But then book four closes and the main message in all of book four is keep waiting. God is on his throne. Keep waiting. I told that to someone this week and they said, but I hate waiting. Then book five opens. Psalm 107. The tone is the same, but something's different. Again, you get repeated history of God's faithfulness. But then suddenly this metaphor bursts forth in Psalm 104, beginning in verse 33. This magnificent metaphor. It says that God changes magnificent, beautiful, fruitful land into desert. And you think, yeah, that's, that's exactly what's happened to Israel. And you, you, you read that and you can hear the music moan. You can hear the depression, the, the, the deepness that comes in. 
But then that metaphor, he immediately goes on to say, God also changes that same wilderness, that same desert, that same dry land back into fruitful land filled with with water and flowing and blessing. And immediately your mind is quickened and you be, it, it, the music has picked up. There is anticipation. Is he talking about the hope of redemption? Is he talking about restoring the promises to David? And then you get three Psalms of David right in a row. David's voice has been noticeably silent, but then you get three Psalms of David right in a row. And Psalm 110 is the climax of those three Psalms. By the way, followed by three Psalms of just praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And that first Psalm of David After that metaphor of anticipation, David, his voice comes forward and says, God has promised the scepter shall not depart from Judah. You got to understand this is the first time since Psalm 89 that the promises of God have been talked about. And then it builds and it builds and then it's reintroduced. The theme is reintroduced. You say, pastor, just say it plainly to me. Catch this. Listen to me. Psalm 110 is the direct answer to Psalm 89. The questions that were proposed way back in Psalm 89. Where is the Davidic king? Has been Teased, it has been moved like a symphony, prolonging the question so that you would wait, so that you would wait, so that you would have anticipation. And then David's voice burst forth, and Psalm 110 is the answering. The lingering questions are finally answered. Now, look at verse 1 of Psalm 110. It says, A psalm of David. The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai. I know in your English versions, we just use the word Lord instead of Yahweh for a title. But but in our English versions, it puts the word Lord in all caps. That is the word Yahweh. That is God's name, God's title. So this verse reads, a psalm of David. Yahweh said to my Adonai. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So the question becomes, who is the Adonai that Yahweh is speaking to? You see, if someone else had written the psalm, then you might think that God said to David and and that he's calling David his Lord as a title of honor or the king. Even if it was one of David's kingly descendants like Solomon, it would be okay because David is the one who's been given the promises and a son always shows honor to the father. But David is the author of this psalm. David is the one who is speaking. David, the one who has received all the promises as it is his kingly line. It is his descendants. David is the one who is writing this psalm. And David hears Yahweh says, say to his Adonai, to his Lord, sit at your right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But this is a promise that's given to David's descendants. How could there be a coming one from David's line that David would call him Lord? That would never be done in the ancient world. The father is always in higher honor than the son. Why is it that David is looking down his line and he hears Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now look at verse four. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. 
You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, guys, I only have a short period of time to give you a quick explanation of what's going on here. So in your minds, we have to go back to Genesis 14. There is this enigmatic text in Genesis 14 where, where this figure just burst forth and now is being made reference to here. So in Genesis 14, Abraham has, uh, there have been some warring kings in the region, uh, kind of five kings versus four kings, and they're, they're not really large armies. They're, they're more like uh, uh, raiding parties that come in and, and fight and, and pillage and take off uh, resources and then run back to their region. Well, Lot has gotten caught up in that, and, and Sodom and this whole region has lost the battle. And Abraham raises up and takes his uh, little band and his army, his fit men, they go up and they win that battle. And they are on their way back to their home, and they are dispersing some of the spoils from victory. And then suddenly out of nowhere, seemingly just pops up, there is this figure, Melchizedek, that David, or, or sorry, that Abraham in this moment offers a tenth, a tithe to Melchizedek. So there he is. He just pops up. He's given no genealogy. His name means king of righteousness. He is the king of Salem, which is right there in the region. It probably later becomes Jerusalem. And he is a priest. He is a priest king. Which where David sits under the law of Moses has been separated. It's been divorced. It is not allowed. The kingly line shall be from Judah and the priest from Levi and the high priest from Aaron. And you have to remember, right before David's kingdom, Saul, right before David, Saul offered a sacrifice as king and had the kingdom removed from him. But back in Genesis 14, Abraham, the one who had the promises of God, the one who, who had the promises that his seed would bless all the nations, all the world would be blessed through his seed, this Abraham bows down to the priest king of Salem. And it's just this, this enigmatic thing that pops up and then disappears and nothing else is referred to it. And now David, listening, Probably 500 years later, David, listening, says he hears Yahweh say to his Adonai, the coming later king from his line, his Adonai, that he will also be a priest king, according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's piece all of these things together. Let's trek with me here. Because you have Psalm 89 asking the question, where is the Davidic king? It's not showing up in history. The Davidic line has been wiped out. The temple has been destroyed. Destroyed. Jerusalem is in rubble. Where is the Davidic king? And the answer from the Psalms is, wait, wait. Wait, God is faithful. Wait, a thousand years are like one day to God. Wait, wait. And then suddenly burst on the scene three Psalms of David with the climax. And from David's own lips is the declaration. Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand, you and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And you read it and you suddenly declare, this is God's answer from David's own lips, that there is coming one from the line of David who is greater than David, that David calls him Lord. And there is coming one who will be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, who is greater than Abraham, the one who has all the promises. Listen to me. God is promising 
written a thousand, uh, a thousand years before Jesus ever shows up, compiled in the Psalms 500 years before Jesus ever shows up, all of it weaving together where God is making the declaration, I am sending my son, the eternal one. The promises that are given towards the eternal kingdom are coming through the eternal one. Guys, this is why the New Testament authors pick up this text more than any other. And they quote it and they quote it and they show it to their fellow Jews. And they say, don't you see, God promised the coming of his son. You see, from our perspective, we're all playing checkers. But God is playing chess. He is weaving, he is writing, he is predicting, he is preserving, even in the order of the Psalms, telling and preserving for us hundreds of years before the events ever occur that Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is the coming one. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now you say, all right, pastor, that was a lot. This was a seminary class. That was a whole lot of information. I took a lot of notes. I'm going to have to go back and review that. But what on earth does that have to do with my life? Well, I'm glad you asked. I know our lives are filled with so much noise. So much noise. Listen to the sound of culture, and what do you hear? I mean, you turn on the news, right? It's the war in Ukraine. It's, it's inflation. It's our struggling economy. It's the next wave of COVID that's inevitably right around the corner. It's school violence. It's gender confusion. It's anxiety. It's depression. And everything just keeps getting louder and louder. And if you listen to the sound of your daily grind, what do you hear? Well, Susie's tired of the way that her boss is treating her and is about to tell him off. And the office gossip is that Craig's cheating on his wife and almost got caught by his 12-year-old son. And Don is lazy and always complains about what everyone else is doing. And if you're a stay-at-home mom, you constantly hear, stop looking at me. He touched me. I'm bored. Mom, you know I hate broccoli. Why'd you put it on my plate? It's the sound of discontent and envy and selfishness. And what about the sound of your own heart? As you wake up in that same old bed and eat that same old cereal and drive in that same old car to that same old job, as Solomon says, it's the sound of weariness under the sun. And most of the Psalms try and encourage you in, the, in the, the weariness of life. But Psalm 110 in this movement, this string of Psalms is trying to lift your head above the noise, above the grind, above the, the messiness of life where, where David is coming and inviting you and says, come, listen, I want you to hear I want you to hear what Yahweh has promised, what Yahweh says to my Adonai. Come and see. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In the ancient world, the right Seat at the right hand of the king was a place of honor. Even at the dinner table, who sat to the right of the host, that was a special seat. In 1 Kings 2, 19 and 20, King Solomon is on his throne and his mother Bathsheba comes in with a special request. And in this account, Solomon sets up a seat right next to him, at his right hand. And she sits there and he says to her, mother, ask anything you wish and I will grant it to you. But here, God the Father says to Jesus, his son, sit 
and I will fight for you. I will subdue your enemies. I will make them as a footstool. In the ancient world, it was common practice to leave your enemies alive, especially the king, and then to parade them around in embarrassment and in shame to show that you had conquered over them. There are even some accounts of forcing the king to get down on all fours so that you could put your feet on him like a footstool. You know, one of the remains that we found of King Tutankhamun in the Egyptian pyramids when we found those artifacts was he had a footstool and on it he carved all the other kings that he had conquered. And here God says to the son, sit here and I will make your enemies as a footstool for you. I will fight. You sit, I will fight for you. And in verse two, he, he will expand his rule, implying that his rule will go over all the nations, all the earth. And in verse three, a swift, powerful army is promised to rise up. Jesus, you have to understand. This is where, uh, believer, you have to understand. This is where Jesus sits right now. Do you hear it in the psalm? The promised coming king who in our version has already come. But after his death and resurrection and ascension, Ephesians 1 says now he sits at the father's right hand. And the New Testament repeats over and over again that he is sitting because his work is finished. He is resting. He is the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He is done and he is sitting. And the New Testament says that God the Father is working out all plans that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. The good news of Jesus will go to the ends of the earth. It will not be thwarted. It cannot be stopped. And that every knee will bow and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That all of this is the outworking of all of history. And then at the end of time, death will be defeated and death will be laid at the feet of Jesus and surrendered as the last enemy to be overcome. That everything is from him and through him and to him. That all things are working out for his glory, for the glory of his name. That it will not end. That it will go to the ends of the earth. That Jesus Christ right now is ruling and reigning. That he is head over the church. That all things will be accomplished. That no one can stop and no one can thwart. Believer, this is where he is. That the king has come. And the king is coming. Two quick points of application, and then I'm done. The imagery of a reigning king, Jesus with a vast, victorious army, well, that doesn't sit too well with our sophisticated 21st century ideas of God. King, that's an archaic form of government. We celebrate democracy, freedom of the people, freedom of choice. It's all right if you picture Jesus as a baby washing his disciples' feet or even hanging on the cross. But please don't offend everyone by describing Jesus as the authoritative reigning king. He who was born in poverty and laid in a manger is now seated at the Father's right hand. He who fled to Egypt as a refugee is now worshipped by angels. He who had no honor in his hometown is now head of the church. He who entered into Jerusalem on a donkey will come riding on the clouds. He who was rejected by Israel when they yelled crucify him is now king of kings. He who became a curse for my sin hanging on a tree is now Lord of lords. And I ask you, do you see him as king? Do I treat him as my king or my elected official? 
You see, you're elected official, you call and you let them know. I'm watching how you vote. Do you treat him as sovereign or one who gives helpful suggestions? To see him as king is to be filled with conviction that he is the king. But it's also to be filled with courage. Above the noise, above the chaos, above the confusion and anxiety, beloved Jesus is on his throne. Jesus is on his throne. The God who worked out the course of history for thousands of years. I guess I should rest. Because Jesus always has the last word. You see, there's a reason that you and I should be filled with hope, that we should be filled with courage. John G. Patton was a Scottish missionary that was ultimately called to New Hebrides Island, which are a chain of islands off South Pacific, where some of the most difficult to reach people had ever been to hear the gospel in the, in the 1800s. In fact, the, Lush, the London Missionary Society had sent two sets of missionaries on two different occasions. One set being run off after months with hostility and the other killed and eaten by cannibals within minutes of going ashore. You can imagine the way that the news spread and was received as many argued that these aborigines on New Hebrides Island were subhuman, incapable of receiving the gospel. The reality is, is they truly were a depraved people. They practiced infanticide and even widow suicide, the killing of the widow's deceased husbands so that they could serve their husbands in the next world. Well, years after these two sets of missionary, John G. Patton and his wife felt powerfully called by God to go to New Hebrides, confident that Christ would save the Aborigines and that those who had gone before had not died in vain. As he and his wife left for the mission field, they were met by stiff opposition from the elders in their church. A one Mr. Dixon exploded, the cannibals, you will be eaten by the cannibals. You see, the memory of the previous couple was still too fresh. But to this, Patton responded, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon that you will be laid in the grave and there you will be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can live and die and serve the honor of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms. And in the great day of my resurrection, my body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our, of our risen Redeemer. Now, lest you think whenever they set out that everything was easy, think again. Because there was one fateful night on the island where John and his wife Mary were in their homes and suddenly heard the sound of their home being surrounded by soldiers intent on taking their lives. It was one terror-filled night that the couple fell on their knees. They prayed to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, would you please protect us? It was a horrible night. Intermittent with their prayers, their missionaries could hear the cries of the savages and imagine them coming through the door to take their lives. And as the sun began to rise, to their astonishment, they found that the natives had retreated to the forest. They couldn't believe that they were still alive and rejoiced at God's protection. The couple bravely continued their work. It was about a year later that the chief of the tribe was saved and converted. As Patton spoke with him, he remembered that horror-filled night and asked the chief why his men didn't come and kill them. The chief replied in a surprise, well, who were all those men who were with you, Pat? Who were all those men who were with you? Patton replied, uh, there were no men who were with us. It was just me and my wife. The chief began to argue. 
There were hundreds of tall men in shining garments with drawn sword circling about your house so that we could not attack you. Friend, I share that story to encourage your faith, to remind you the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is on his throne. The one who came and is coming was predicted and anticipated from the beginning of time that God wove intricately and delicately in magnificent fashion through his word is coming again. And you and I have every reason to be filled with hope and courage as we bow before our king. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are our king. We love you and we love your word and we cannot believe the way that you have unfolded and revealed yourself to us in your word. Father, may our faith be stirred up. May we be filled with courage. May we believe your word. May we trust you. May we trust your character. And may we come to you at the desperate, dark times of life, God. And may we remember that you are the king and that you are ruling and that you are reigning. And we can trust you. We can trust you. You have promised that you will work all things out for our good and for the glory of your name. And we wish nothing more than with our lives to see the name of Jesus high and lifted up. To see the lost come to know you as we have come to know you. To have our hearts filled with courage and praise because you are worthy. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.